And we begin tonight with another horrifying milestone. More than 250,000 Americans have now died from COVID-19. To put that into perspective, an estimated 250,000 people attended the 1963 March on Washington. This is a picture from that day. And let that sink in for a moment. That is the scale of loss we're talking about. What's more horrifying is that things are only going to get worse. Doctors on the White House Coronavirus Task Force are warning that the U.S. could see an average of 1,500 deaths a day next week and up to 2,000 a day by Christmas unless we do more to stop the virus. That is the big picture. And here's the picture on the ground from a nurse in Nebraska. I just got off of my third 12-hour shift this week. Not once this week have I been in my home unit. I have been in the COVID ICU all week and um, I'm exhausted. I have seen so many emergent intubations. Um, I've seen people more sick than I've ever seen in my life and they just drop so fast. We're understaffed. We have so much on our plates as nurses. There's not enough of us to help. We have, I think they said 10 COVID units. Um, and one of those is just a place for people to go and pass away, unfortunately. Please take it seriously, wear your mask. Um, and I hope I don't see you here. Those are the people we need to hear from right now because we certainly aren't hearing from the president of the United States. He once again had nothing on his schedule today. Must be nice. He hasn't attended a task force meeting in months, and he is actively obstructing the transition to the incoming Biden administration. Here's what the president-elect had to say about that earlier today. We've been unable to get access to the kinds of things we need to know about the depth of the stockpiles. We know there's not much at all. We get to the point where we have a sense of uh, when these vaccines comes out, how they'll be distributed, who'll be first in line, what the plan is. There are over 300 million Americans that are, and beyond our, our border that are going to have to be taken care of. And uh, there's a whole lot of things that are just we just don't have available to us, which unless it's made available soon, we're going to be behind by weeks or months being able to put together the whole initiative relating to the biggest promise we have with two uh, drug companies coming along and finding 95 percent effectiveness efficiency in the vaccines, which is enormous promise. So I just want to tell you that, that that's the only slowdown right now that we have. Starting us off tonight is Dr. Celine Gounder. She's an infectious disease specialist and a member of the Biden-Harris COVID Advisory Board. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to chat about this. You heard the president-elect lay out some of the things his team doesn't have access to right now due to the delay and the transition. From a healthcare provider's perspective, how concerned are you about everything he mentioned today? Well, it's really hard to take care of patients with COVID if you don't have the necessary personal protective equipment, for example, if you don't have the gowns, the gloves, the masks, the face shields. We have been running um, in scarcity rationing mode since the beginning of the pandemic. I still, when I go take care of patients at Bellevue Hospital, I get three N95 masks for the week, no matter how many patients I'm caring for. I've been using the same face shield since March. Um, and now we're dealing with a surge in cases. So even though we were already um, dealing with scarcity, now it's going to be even worse because we uh, simply have so many more patients to care for. Um, and, you know, one of the major issues with, with the lack of transition here is that supply chains, manufacturing, these are key components to whether it's uh, gearing up, uh, ramping up supplies of personal protective equipment or how do you get a vaccine to people? You have to understand that manufacturing process, the timelines, the logistics of getting all of these supplies out to the people, knowing where they're most needed and most urgently needed. Um, and so those are the kinds of details we've been pleading to be on the inside, having those conversations with the current administration, current team, 
and they're simply not uh, allowing us, the GSA is not allowing us not having um, certified the, the election results and um, not letting us move forward with this. You have been using the same face shield since March. How could that be possible? How is it possible that we are so many months into this pandemic and there's not a stockpile or at least a system to replenish the stockpile of PPE that can go uh, to hospitals nationwide in some systemic fashion? Well, we've been pleading with the current president to invoke the Defense Production Act, which is um, power that he has through executive orders to order manufacturers to produce PPE, just as you could order manufacturers to build tanks and, and aircraft carriers if we were at war with a foreign power. Um, we have been pleading for this for months, and the president simply has not done so. Uh, this is actually one of the very first executive orders that the president-elect intends to issue uh, because he realizes that it's it's very difficult for us to be doing our jobs when we simply aren't equipped to do so. Yeah, that's it's completely nuts to think about the fact that we're so many months into this and we haven't figured out on a policy standpoint um, how to, to get that production underway. If President Trump were listening right now to this conversation we're having, what would you tell him about the damage he's doing and that he could possibly avoid if he just cooperated with the transition team? Well, I would plead with the president to come out and say, look, masks work. Um, you know, I, I know I might have been wrong in my messaging, you know, over the last several months, but look, they do work. Um, I would hope that he would express some empathy for the people who have lost family members who will be losing family members over the coming months. Um, and I think just those two actions alone would really go a long way to healing the nation right now. Absolutely. We did get some good news today. It was from Pfizer. They said their vaccine is 95% effective and they see they'll seek FDA approval within days. Is the Biden team actively working on its own distribution plans? You saw the president-elect today talk about that being an aspect of the planning uh, in the coming weeks uh, and it, it being uh, difficult given the lack of cooperation from the Trump team. We are moving forward with our own plans because we have no choice, but there are really critical uh, data inputs you need in fleshing out a plan like that, that those data are being withheld from us. And so on the one hand, it is amazing that we have these two vaccine candidates that already have very good efficacy and safety data that are both going to be submitted to the FDA for emergency use authorizations. We are not putting any pressure on the FDA to expedite those approvals. We want them to go through the normal scientific vetting process because we also realize it's really important for people to trust that these are effective and safe vaccines. But even then, once you get that authorization, you have to get these vaccines into people's arms. They're not of any use sitting on a shelf or in a, in a freezer. So that's a huge logistical challenge that remains ahead. Absolutely. That seems like a, a, a very big obstacle in terms of um, just the logistics of getting uh, uh, into the arms of 300 million Americans. And then if it's a two-dose thing, you have to make mm -hmm. twice as much. Um, what has the Biden-Harris Advisory Board uh, recommended uh, to people that they do, um, and also what they will do on day one, uh, that the current administration is not recommending? Well, I would say masks. This is something you can do now. You don't have to wait for the Biden-Harris administration to take office on January 20th. It is in the power of every single American to wear masks. They are effective. Uh, they protect the person who wears them. If they protect the person who's wearing the mask from spreading the infection to others if they happen to be harboring the virus. Masks are cheap. And by the way, masks don't shut down the economy. If you want to keep the economy open, this is a cheap, highly effective thing you can do um, to do so. And, you know, it's really unfortunate that we've seen masks politicized in this way. I think of masks like toilet paper. Um, you know, the, it's a basic hygienic uh, intervention. It really should not be a political question whether you use toilet paper or you use a mask. Um, you know, the other key things you're going to see happening um, shortly after uh, the team takes office 
is a massive ramping up of testing because that's in a sense your radar. It's, it's what allows you to know what's happening, where, how quickly and, and why. And if you don't have that information, it's very difficult to control the spread. Absolutely, and it feels like, you know, what I know from other countries' responses, um, like South Korea, for example, that was one of the first things they did was ramp up uh, their testing so that they would be able to identify where the spread was happening so that they could contact trace and stop the spread. And I feel like that, th that is something that we need to be doing here. Uh, thank you so much for being here. That was great information. I hope folks um, are feeling confident that they can wear a mask um, and, and, and hopefully wait out uh, this Trump administration so that the Biden-Harris team can implement the plans you just talked about.